just count me in. Welcome to this webinar version of the Yamalava and Plethka podcast, Logical, here on and with Council Bar today. My name is Tim Elliott, and I'm here to chat to Ludmilla Yamalava. Ludmilla is the managing partner of Yamalava and Plethka here in Dubai. The two main topics are going to be employment and then wills and inheritance. And the slant proposed will, of course, be the situation here in the UAE. And the main thrust of the discussion is going to be changes and development or not, given the impact of COVID-19, unprecedented times. So, Miller, always good to see you. Let's begin with employment. Now, COVID-19 has brought economies to practically a standstill across the world. Social distancing measures are being strictly enforced and businesses have to change how they operate. Now, new guidance and new legislation is being frequently introduced right now. We learn more every day. As a result, both businesses and their employees have growing concerns on how this is going to affect them in the long run. Now, we'll come to the employee perspective in a moment, but let's consider the business owner's perspective first. And this is something you can speak to directly through your experience with your own practice over the last, what, five, six weeks of uh, near total lockdown. Now, first off, how have things been for you as a practice in the DMCC, the Dubai Multi Commodities Centre, free zone area? How's, the, how's your experience been? Well, um, the DMCC, for those who are not aware, is um, one of the world's, if not the world's largest free zone. So it is uh, fairly representative and interesting in terms of um, what perhaps is going on with a lot of businesses around the world in terms of um, their experience with COVID-19 and on the one hand and governments um, and other authorities assistance uh, to those businesses from the other hand. Uh, simil uh, similarly, uh, because of, I mean, DMCC is a fairly uh, perhaps representative uh, window into how other authorities and other governments and um, in, in the UAE and perhaps other countries uh, might uh, deal with their businesses. And so from the perspective of the DMCC company in particular, the DMCC authority, uh, we are not immune. The DMCC stands for the Dubai Multi-Commodity Center. So obviously it attracts a lot of commodity type businesses and a lot of energy businesses by the, um, by the same token and all sorts of service providers such as law firms, accounting firms, um, and um, basically any other type of business. Uh, so it's a fairly good window into um, a, a sample of, uh, of businesses um, that are perhaps are affected uh, by COVID-19 more so than others. And, um, you know, but because we are not immune to, um, uh, to COVID-19, you know, perhaps some businesses that are based in, in more health, um, healthcare type uh, industries maybe they're a little less immune or a little more immune than, than the rest of the businesses but us you know dmcc and i would say most of the companies in the dmcc are fairly acutely aware and affected by the day-to-day -day, uh, effects and consequences of covid 19. now and that obviously is manifested in many different ways um, the most immediate for for a uh, for us and for a lot of our clients was um, just the shutting down of the uh, of the country's borders because so much of the UAE in particular is based on tourism and events uh, and um, trade and if you just you know, isolate just those three things tourism events and trade that's a huge uh, huge percentage of uh, this, this country's GDPs and, and general economy so when the borders closed, uh, for as far as business is concerned, obviously people are not able to travel into the UAE uh, either to, to do business uh, or to even run their own companies. Uh, also, the UAE has, for the last many years, had a very prominent uh, spot in the world, I guess, events uh, landscape and attracting a lot of global events from all over the world. And they're quite popular and and well attended. Well, all of a sudden, and right now was this is sort of the season for events and conferences and seminars and trade shows. 
and obviously all those businesses have um, um, have not been able to operate and on people who have had plans to come and attend these events or or uh, or display a showcase their products at these events are no longer uh, no longer able to do so and obviously with tourism that means airlines hotel hotels restaurants all of the f and b's just so that the, the physical closure of the country's borders affected lots of businesses immediately. Um, then that's that's one. Two, obviously, just our ability to even go into the offices and go around uh, uh, the city and um, even places like stores and restaurants. And that affects all businesses, in particular those who rely on customers and clients and foot traffic. Um, so in um, so that's you know there's there's that and then because of it and it, this is a, a chain reaction and it's a spider web because of this uh, the, the businesses have not been able to uh, to do business therefore have not been able to generate revenue because they don't generate revenue they're not able necessarily to keep up with all of their expenses ordinary expenses uh, and um, including uh, paying or, or or servicing their obligations such as as bank loans, business loans, corporate loans, uh, and, um, and and also their employees' salaries, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so the effects were quite immediate uh, and quite um, uh, you know quite severe. And so, um, and what's what's making it even more difficult is to predict as to how long this will last and uh, what the, uh, the the totality of the effect and the circumstances. Uh, and uh, what will be? It's been, and I hate to use the phrase, unprecedented times, because it's what we hear every day, but it is exactly that, unprecedented. And as you said there, the response is just unknown. We don't know how to respond to something that we don't or can't create a timeline for. In terms of extra or even extraordinary government intervention in the economy, Ludmilla. Just just run us through what we've seen. Well, they have in a number of measures, just like in so many other countries around the world, Government, the government in the UAE has been quite swift in, in introducing various measures that, um, um, and they can continue to roll with different measures that, uh, that either facilitate or ease the burden of businesses uh, on an ongoing basis. So some of the more significant ones, I'll tell you, for example, from the financial obligations perspective is that there have been government mandates uh, to the central bank uh, that have um, um, have uh, forced the banks or ordered the banks to ultimately freeze uh, the enforcement of various um, bank guarantees. So, for example, for businesses, those who have monthly obligations, loan business loans, corporate loans, financial commitments that they have to service on a monthly basis. For now, there is a bit of a grace period or reprieve for them to um, have to pay those uh, those commitments and those loans on an ongoing basis. Uh, so in the past, for example, when you don't make one monthly payment as a business or as an individual, uh, then um, uh, banks would often exercise securities that they hold uh, in the support of those or as guarantees uh, for those loans. Uh, and those financial obligations. Well, now, as per the government mandate, the banks have stopped uh, that practice, and our and everything is sort of put on hold uh, for the purposes of at least uh, banks securing or trying to uh, secure and enforce their obligations or, or their uh, their their loan payments. And that's been huge for businesses. It's huge because uh, in the past, if you don't make one payment, your whole business can come to um, to a halt in uh, a matter of. Um, just a few days uh, if mm. a bank tries to enforce a security and in the UAE securities that the banks hold are checks and so in most cases especially for for large uh, for bigger for businesses or especially bigger businesses those checks are for fairly significant amounts and when the check bounces it's a criminal offense so for business it's not just the financial obligation but it's also the criminal sanctions that come along with their inability to service those obligations. So for the government and for the banks to uh, make an announcement and have this initiative that gives businesses some time to um, uh, to uh, service their um, uh, monthly obligations, it has been a huge relief. So that's one example. And that also applies to, um, uh, to other types of financial agreements or financial commitments. For example, if you hold a mortgage, and because a lot of businesses as well, 
uh, may have mortgages for the offices which they occupy and lease uh, for their businesses. Um, so again, if you have a mortgage, you have monthly commitments to pay that mortgage. And so with, uh, with this init initiative, all those obligations have been put on hold. Uh, and that's been a huge relief for a lot of businesses. Uh, and now uh, that's that's one example. The other example is for, and the DMCC in particular has been quite forthcoming and swift in introducing these, these initiatives is to allow businesses, uh, for example, discounts and grace periods and extensions to either renew their licenses or uh, uh, renew their visas of their employees uh, or pay their rental uh, obligations or leases, uh, in, uh, at least in particular in cases where businesses are renting directly from the government. So there have been a number of initiatives that allowed businesses um, to, um, to benefit from extensions and discounts on license renewal fees and, and, and uh, benefit from grace periods to renew licenses. Uh, and um, and also for, um, for a lot of um, lease payments and that for businesses, these are quite significant commitments. Uh, so at least that's as far as the government is concerned because obviously the government can make decisions for itself and particularly for those businesses who have been renting and, and have uh, more I guess, significant connections with the government, that has been a huge relief. Uh, some of the other initiatives have been as well for in, on the immigration side of things. And uh, in particular, any visas that, uh, and these are residential visas, and in the UAE, it affects the majority of us unless you're a UAE national, uh, that um, uh, these, uh, if you have any visa that was expiring uh, between March of this year and end of this year, they have been automatically renewed uh, to in, at, at least until January 2020, so without having to do anything. Now, it may seem like a small thing, but it's not because it's huge and, and it has been on many people's minds for uh, for a long time just because it does affect our ability to be in this country legally is always based on having proper valid uh, immigration status. And that status obviously is supported by UAE um, residence visa. And so if your visa is expiring, then all of a sudden you've overstayed your welcome here and uh, under normal circumstances there are penalties, immigration penalties that uh, that are attached to overstaying visas and a number of other issues arise as a result. Uh, and another important element as far as visas are concerned is that all, uh, for a few years now in the UAE, all residential visas are linked to health insurance payments. So in other words, if you want to be in this country and if you want to sponsor an individual, uh, that uh, sponsor has to pay for health insurance. So for example, let's say we had five employees uh, whose visas were expiring March or April. Uh, all of their visas, in addition to paying the visa fees, which are significant, we're talking about several thousand dollars uh, for each employee, you'd also have to renew their health insurance because the insurance and uh, the visas are linked. Uh, so now by virtue of extending these visas, uh, then uh, you don't have to worry as an employer or as a sponsor, you don't have to worry about the immigration uh, or the visa payments uh, and the health insurance payments that come along with it. Uh, so all of a sudden, for, as a business, we just kind of to sum it up, if you are a business, for example, that is based in the DMCC and that had a license a renewal that was due, let's say in April, um, and a few, a few other employees whose visas were expiring, uh, under normal circumstances, as part of also license renewal, there's some there's other insurance um, plans or uh, or coverage that also comes due at that same time, including audits and uh, in each one of these commitments or obligations uh, come at a price. So now when you when you push back all these um, the performance of these obligations for a business that um, that might have whose license might have been expiring in April, now they don't have to worry about it for at least a few months. Uh, including servicing their uh, financial obligations to banks, for example. Uh, so you can see that this particular period, if, if any businesses that have found themselves um, uh, uh, with those, uh, those sort of set of circumstances at this point in time, they will have greatly benefited, at least in the interim. Now, what happens, fast forward three or four months, um, we, that remains to be seen, and uh, by the looks of it, the government is assessing the situation on a daily basis and uh, we expect further regulations to um, be rolled out as, as we go through this pandemic together.
I mean, that's where, really where I wanted to go next, because we've seen measures, extraordinary measures from the government. We've seen free zones uh, taking measures, but all of those measures have limited applicability, perhaps till, say, the end of June. Uh, and that's understandable. COVID-19 is a new threat. You can only legislate so far with the limited information available. But it's becoming clear, isn't it, Lula, that COVID-19 is here for many months to come. Life does not go back to normal on June the 30th. So beyond June really is the question. And that is, uh, that's the, uh, the big question. Uh, like I say, a million dollar question, perhaps mm. multi-million dollar question at this point is what, what will happen after uh, after this period has expired. And a lot of these initiatives and regulations and circulars and announcements that the UAE government has put out uh, in, for obvious reasons, have a, a, sort of a period or a term. It's either through the end of the year, some of its immigration policies, for example, or, uh, or offsets or, or stimulus packages for businesses in the DMCC. But some have expiration at the end of May, some at the end of June. And with regards to the banks, um, uh, there have been different sort of mandates as to how long the banks uh, are not allowed, for example, to uh, to enforce their um, uh, their guarantees. Uh, so, but the big question, okay, so now once we've come to the end of these various grace periods or these various uh, extensions, be it three months or even end of the year, what happens then? So one of the big questions, and one of the other, by the way, before I go back to that answer, uh, but one of the other important um, initiatives that the government here rolled out, and that applies in particular for Dubai and Abu Dhabi, there have been specific statements that disallow courts, uh, the rental courts, for example, to hear any eviction hearings or cases. And that obviously is very important because if you're a business or even an individual and your lease is expiring in this period of time and you're just uh, financially not able uh, to pay that lease in the past, you would have obviously been facing eviction and and penalties and all sorts of other um, consequences related to that. At least with this initiative, uh, the um, it's been clear that the government, at least, is um, in no uncertain terms telling businesses or landlords uh, to not rush to the courts to enforce or to, to pursue evictions because the courts will not be here in those cases. Once again, giving more breathing room. To, uh, to the businesses to figure out what to do next. Well, now uh, using that particular example to, to kind of add that example to the other list of stimulus um, offers, uh, then what happens come September? Now with all these uh, financial obligations or loans and mortgages that you have not been able to pay for the last three, four or five months, does that mean that now you erase all those um, looking backwards and now you just start paying them as of September when uh, let's say this pandemic has uh, or the most of it or the scariest part of it has passed uh, or are you still you do you still have to pay the, the all the obligations you have defaulted on until that point in time and if that's the case I mean you can imagine basically in a way kicking the can down down the road it will, it will catch up with us uh, sooner or later and then and when it does it could be fairly significant. So we don't know yet. And that also applies to rental disputes. And so if I haven't been able to pay my rent for the last three or four months, okay, that's given me that uh, extra, uh, I guess, time to sleep peaceful at night. At least I will have somewhere to sleep or somewhere to run my business from. But fast forward three or four months, what happens? Am I now going to have to pay rent for the future plus uh, the previous uh, four or five months that I haven't been able to pay uh, and or face eviction. Um, so this is where we still, it still remains to be seen. And I guess we all want to be optimists and we all want to uh, hope that this will pass sooner rather than later. But uh, we also need to be pragmatic and uh, be very realistic about our own ability to, um, to be able to uh, continue to service our obligations uh, moving forward, uh, let alone the ones that we have already defaulted on from the time uh, of the, the start of this pandemic and the lockdown. I want to move on to employee obligations, which you mentioned uh, in passing. So from commercial to employee, um, we've seen measures being enforced at this time. But could you talk me through Ministerial Resolution 279? 
Yes, well, so um, what's important to highlight is that in the UAE, in terms of the employment regulations or laws, we have effectively two types of legislation. One, the legislation that applies to the federal legislation, that's the, what we, that is often referred to as the UAE labor law. And that applies to all employees and all companies uh, that are not in one of two free zones, either in the DIFC, and DIFC stands for the Dubai International Financial Center, that's its own special free zone that has its own laws, or ADGM, which is the Abu Dhabi Global Markets. So those two free zones have their own laws, and including employment laws. Otherwise, the, um, uh, the labor law applies to all employees and all companies equally, uh, to, uh, irrespective of the Emirates. Now, as I say that, so that while the law applies equally, the, um, the procedural regulations and uh, perhaps certain nuances or, or additional uh, regulations and benefits are also reserved for specific free zones. So let's say the DMCC has its own regulations in terms of uh, additional regulations in terms of how it administers uh, labor disputes. Uh, and, and who the authority is. So every free zone has its own authority before you go to the labor court. If every free zone has its own authority through which you have to go in order to bring that, um, uh, that uh, spe special um, uh, employment case, for example. Uh, so, and then, so when these regulations come out, it, it's important to, to look at who is, you know, who, which, who is the authority that's issuing these regulations. So this particular regulation you're referring to was actually issued by the Ministry of Labor. Now, Ministry of Labor, by yeah, under normal circumstances, applies to all non-free zone companies. So that it, it regulates companies that are uh, not based in free zones. And then free zones have their own authorities that, that regulate. So therefore, technically speaking, that particular reg regulations applies to, definitely applies to all companies other than DIFC and, and ADGM uh, that are not based in free zones. And in the UAE terms, they're referred to as uh, LLCs or limited liability companies or mainland companies. So with regards to that particular regulation as to whether and whether it applies to free zones um, or other free zones, uh, the regulation itself is not as clear, but it is, um, it is reasonable to, um, it's, it's reasonable to assume, uh, and we have already seen some examples of this, uh, that other free zones will follow suit. And either clearly is, adopt that particular regulation or, or issue their own regulations um, that more or less parallel uh, the Ministry of Labor regulation. Now with regards to what that, so, so that was important to highlight because it does not necessarily apply to all companies and all employees equally. And then, but with regards to the content of it, um, I mean, in short, it, um, it allows, uh, it, it sets a framework for companies and employees uh, to deal with immediate um, uh, changes to their staffing and, um, and the potential options of, of how to deal with them. So, for example, and then just in simple terms to divide it up, um, there are two ways of, of looking at it. One is if you as a business trying to make some temporary adjustments to your employees' uh, uh, compensation and employees' um, employment terms, and then there's always the permanent adjustments. So with regards to the temporary adjustments, uh, and they could be by virtue of, for example, unpaid leave uh, or, uh, or um, uh, reduction of salary, but these are temporary adjustments. Uh, so they, they, these regulations allow for these adjustments to be introduced, uh, but with the consent of the employee, uh, and they have to be registered with the relevant government authority. And, there ha and among other things, there has to be a specific date um, uh, in indicated by which uh, these special temporary amendments uh, are you know, remain, remain effective. Now, with regards to more uh, more permanent uh, changes, and in particular, and this is really where it affects most employees, in particular, uh, with uh, terminations. Uh, those term those uh, there are some provisions as to as well as to how businesses are handling them before, and it's the regulation still needs to be interpreted, and we need to see it in practice. Um, but uh, in general, what we see is that there are some, um, there is something, a, a sort of a, a gradual process by which the legislators are hoping that the businesses will make the permanent decisions and adjustments to their employees' um, 
uh, employees uh, terms and conditions for example before they terminate them uh, there is at least a checklist of some of the other things that businesses should try to do such as uh, first send their employees on paid leave then it's on paid leave and then try to perhaps reduce their salaries before they make the, the very the, the ultimate decision of uh, terminating their employment and so and once that happens if they do get to that point where they have to terminate their employment and this is perhaps the most important part of the regulation is there is some language in the um, uh, the decree that suggests one, on one hand that uh, any such employees uh, should uh, their records should be registered with this sort of virtual labor market so that other companies or other employers should be able to at least identify who those people are on the job market and, and in theory be able to, um, uh, to hire them. Uh, so, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, employers, at least the language of the regulation seems to suggest that employers will continue to be responsible for the employees' housing allowances. And, um, and this is a term that also is still subject to interpretation. Uh, for employees, for example, for whom their employers or their companies have been providing housing, uh, that regulation seems to be fairly clear with regards to those employees continuing to benefit from the free housing. So in other words, let's say if I have, if I have 100 uh, laborers and, I have, and they have been living in labor accommodation, so and I now know I do not need those 100 laborers, then I can now terminate this regulation. I can terminate them, but I am required to continue to let them live in that labor accommodation. So I'm required to provide them with housing. Uh, now, so with that scenario, that regulation is, is fairly clear, and that's sort of what it seems to aim to obtain. With regards to so many other employees who, in their contract, in their monthly compensation, have their monthly compensation broken into. Uh, basic salary and then allowances including housing allowances but ultimately in real life they don't get a housing from the company uh, they just get a one lump sum every month in terms of their salary it's not quite clear whether the in, in such cases if the company decides to terminate an employee whether it needs to continue to pay that salary to them uh, towards their housing allowance. That's not quite clear, and that's something that we will have to wait to see how the courts uh, will interpret it. But I will tell you from the business perspective, that would be very difficult for them to sustain this if that's the intention of the regulation. It's an interesting point, and it, I wonder in practical terms, in real terms, how much say does an employee have in decisions being made subsequent to Ministerial Resolution 279, and of course, COVID-19. Uh, um, could you repeat that, please? What, in practical terms, how much of a say do you have as an employee of a company affected by COVID-19, uh, having seen the Resolution 279? Well, I'll tell you, in practical terms, there's always, and this is, as lawyers, we always kind of find ourselves a bit of a, at a crossroads because on the one hand, there is the legal perspective and the legal basis on which we comment. And then there is obviously the practical um, aspect of what can and cannot be done. So from a legal perspective, we know there's this regulation and that is basically a regulation that applies to both companies and employees in terms of their respective rights and obligations. And so let's say an example of an employer um, having to terminate their employees uh, or at least cut their salaries. We know where the regulations stand. Now, in practical terms, if that company doesn't make money, is not making money because all of their customers and, and clients are not paying them, and yet they have their own obligations that are not able to service, including their bank loans, for example, then in practical terms, what can you do? I mean, if, can you really afford to pay your employees housing for the next X number of months? Uh, or And can you even pay them what you would otherwise be uh, required to pay them, obligated to pay them in terms of their end of service termination benefits in practical terms it's a, it's a very difficult question because even if legally you're in the right and even if you have a decision from the court that clearly sets that out and says the company is obligated to pay you x amount in practical terms what can you do with that court decision if the company doesn't have money and if the company by that time will have closed its doors 
Um, so there's always this legal and practical um, interplay, and which is very important, and this is something what we do in our practice always is to, to advise clients from a practical standpoint, because what, what a lot of clients risk doing is, is spending their uh, hard-earned money and, and rapidly dwindling savings to pursue these employment cases, for example, against um, their employees, even if they're in the right. And then having a court judgment, and we see this quite regularly in this practice, uh, and um, and then not being able to enforce on that judgment. So now you will have spent X number of months, if not years, pursuing a particular uh, court decision or court judgment. And then you spend obviously thousands and thousands of dollars pursuing that. And then at the end, the company doesn't have any assets to cover uh, that judgment. So, so you ask the very relevant question, which is the practical aspects. And this is why what we always recommend is at these times, as now I mean, become a very used up and ubiquitous uh, saying that we are all in this alone together so but we are truly in this together so our recommendation is to all um, to both employees and employers that work together just keeping in mind that practical uh, challenges and um, if not impossibilities um, to comply with the, the legal aspects of or obligations and so therefore as an employee, perhaps you don't you you don't agree to taking a pay cut. You don't agree to taking a paid uh, a paid vacation. You certainly don't agree, perhaps, to take an unpaid vacation. Uh, but um, and because for obvious reasons, nobody is one who wants to be in this, and 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 we all live by and we work for money. So we the, you know, that money stops coming. It becomes very difficult very quickly. In particular, in a place like the UAE, where this is. We're majority of us here are expats, and it's not like we can go run to our, uh, to our parents' home and, and stay with them and, and um, wait this out with them. So uh, because of it, you, our recommendation always is to for the parties to be open with one another and for employees and for employers to be open with their employees and, and be um, forthcoming and for the employees to be understanding and perhaps figuring out a way to agree uh, on, um, on kind of working through these challenges together. Before we move on to wills and inheritance, and I want to get there in a second, a couple of questions from people watching uh, Ludmilla. The impact on Expo 2020, we know it's not taking place, but your thoughts on the impact uh, of that. Uh, and also employment opportunities after, you know, post pandemic. Um, we're clearly headed towards a global recession or global economic pain, however you want to phrase it. But uh, your thoughts on post pandemic opportunities, employment opportunities, but particularly here in the Emirates? Well, you see, so I've been in this country for 12 years now, and I came mm. here uh, shortly at the tail end of the real estate boom and stayed here, sort of uh, caught the tail end of that and rode through the recession at the time. And and that, that time in particular, Dubai was riding so high and the UAE in general was riding so high. So the fall, the that was caused by the financial, the global financial crisis. Obviously, was a very hard one, and it you know the higher you fly, the harder it is to fall. Uh, so, and there were a lot of skeptics uh, at the time in terms of what will happen to Dubai, and or or the country in general. And we recovered, and we recovered. We we evolved, we progressed, and we adapted, and. Um, and sort of regrouped and and um, you know I thought this particular year was going to be a good year especially as we were about to host the expo uh, so now does this so I mean so if you if you draw an experience of that uh, that crisis and then the uh, uh, so the, the the years that followed uh, there were opportunities there are always opportunities and there's always a silver lining and I'm sure that's a discussion for a different day but but there is um, there will be opportunities. I think um, there will be lots of businesses that will be forced to close down. But by the same token, as those businesses close and close down, the well, the business from them will have to be will have to go somewhere else. Will have to be transferred to some other businesses. So those businesses have that have been resilient enough or fortunate enough for whatever reason to survive they may in fact pick up a lot more business um, that um, has come to them or will hopefully will have come to them from other failed businesses. In other words, you're sort of, you're gaining on other people's misery, other people's losses. 
but that's you know that's I mean, a bit of, of human life and, and, and life in general. Um, so will there be opportunities? Yes, I think there will be opportunities like that. Uh, there will always be uh, also be opportunities for other industries that this pandemic has perhaps propelled uh, forward in terms of their importance, like the healthcare industry. Not that it's ever been unimportant, but it's certainly been taken to a different level. And perhaps certain kind of manufacturing companies, you know, at least the ones that manufacture masks and all sorts of cleaning products and disinfectants and such. You can imagine that at least um, those businesses have perhaps been hiring more people because they just had more work. Uh, obviously online retailers and anybody who's had the kind of the online platform to sell uh, before the pandemic would have perhaps benefited a lot more and therefore would have been able to hire more people. Uh, or those who have been able to embrace these, um, these these challenging times by virtue of adapting and adopting new technologies and, and going online and starting selling online, be it products or services. Uh, so, um, so they, and obviously those businesses uh, will have benefited uh, greatly. Any logistics, uh, and the UAE is, has always been logistics hub. So you can see how that potentially, that particular industry will, um, uh, will have, added to its uh, ranks and there are force and opportunities will arise. Uh, so, um, so there will certainly be certain industries that by virtue of this pandemic will actually have benefited and grown and therefore, at least in theory, they should be uh, hiring more people. Uh, and then there'll be those who will have failed and other businesses who are standing will have to pick it up, pick, pick that business up. And then as um, everything else in life, but though we haven't really seen anything this drastic at this scale for very, for probably ever, at least in our lives, lifetimes. But society will, when we come out of this, will be somewhat of a different society. And so with that difference, there could be brand new opportunities, which we're just not really quite uh, cognizant about right now or uh, not yet seeing. But as, uh, as we move on to the next level, I'm certain that there will be other brand new opportunities that uh, are awaiting. Hand washing, that's the thing at the yeah. moment. And with regards to the expo, and that's obviously now the, it has been extended, uh, delayed or postponed, uh, which is in a way disappointing because we're all banking on this 2020. It was a good number, it was a good, um, it was certainly a tremendous campaign and would have been a great initiative and, and uh, event for this country. Uh, but it's not, it hasn't been canceled, it's been postponed, and now the UAE is marketing it as, okay, this is an opportunity to bring the world kind of together again. Uh, so in the interim, what's going to happen? I, I Again, having been here through the previous economic uh, downfall uh, and um, having seen what happened with the real estate industry then, and then having seen it recovered, I, you know, I imagine that if there is if there is a dip, it'll be more of a dip than permanent uh, decline. So there may be some slowdown in terms of the expo related work and services and businesses. But um, I imagine that as, um, you know, as as time goes on, a few months from now, uh, we'll be back at it and perhaps you know, <laughs> greater than ever. That's part one covering employment at this special webinar edition of the Yamala and Political Podcast. Logical here with Council Bar. Let's move on to part two, Ludmilla, and talk about wills and inheritance. And I really want to drill down here. It's, it's a huge topic. It's an emotive topic. But this pandemic is a, a reminder, and it's a grim reminder of the importance for having a will in place. Now, losing a loved one, particularly during a time of crisis like this, is already hard enough without having to deal with the bureaucratic hurdles, uh, frozen assets, probate orders and the like. The courts are operational here in the Emirates. Shifting to an online platform has happened. It's happened relatively smoothly, but it's not frictionless. Um, and it does add potentially some complexity to what's already a complicated probate process. Now, having uh, a will drastically simplifies the process. It provides a clear roadmap for the authorities uh, for families, for people to follow. Um, inheritance matters are inherently complex. And let's build towards complexity. I'm going to start as easily as I can. Let's look at the platforms in the Emirates to start with. Uh, but first of all, jurisdictions, before we go anywhere. 
when assets span multiple jurisdictions, it's tough. Here in the Emirates, that's almost the norm. Uh, wills cover assets subject to different laws, different languages, different religions, attitudes. That creates a challenge for heirs. Complexity being the operative word to the particular subject, as you rightfully pointed out. And this is for, you know, I guess, the simpler, simplest reason, and that is this is such a, such a, such a diverse society, such a cocktail of uh, cultures and nationalities and, and, and backgrounds and religions and uh, values and you know, family histories and such. Uh, and um, that on the one hand, on the other hand, it's such a mixed society. So even you know, most of the families are not so, um, are, are not so simple just by virtue of the, the passports they hold. And uh, we see so many cases, and this is kind of, this is one of the, the fabulous things about the UAE and the society that it has sort of attracted and built is just you could have um, a national of Italy and another national of um, of you know, Hong Kong, for example, and uh, they may have a Hong Kong passport or Chinese passport and an Italian passport, and their kids have American passports, and they or their kids may have American passports and Italian and, and Hong Kong or Chinese passport, and so I mean, and that's a, and and that this sort of scenario is very very typical in the UAE. And it's especially important in the context of family law and inheritance. And that is because when something happens to that particular family, and that uh, you in particular, if there's a death in the family, uh, which law do you apply? Uh, and then which law do you apply to which aspect of that particular relationship? Because you have the commercial aspect and that is the assets that are left behind. And then we also have the children. Right, and so and the children are going to be subject to custody and um, uh, questions and guardianships under which law? Would it be the Italian law? Would it be the Chinese law? Would it be the American law? And so, so something that as um, perhaps as simple as just the number of passports in the family uh, often causes tremendous complications. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you also have because the UAE is a Muslim country and Muslim religion is the primary religion here. And so therefore the, uh, the default law that applies to family issues, the default law is, um, is Sharia, which is the uh, Islamic law. Uh, now that, uh, that particularly, if you are not Muslim, then you can then, there's, there's a number of provisions in the laws that allow parties to opt for some of their, the laws of their home countries, which again is a question mark because you don't know what those home countries are sometimes. Uh, but, uh, but if you are, for example, a Muslim or uh, from a different country and you could be a couple from a family that was born raised in the US, but you're Muslim. So as long as you're living in the UAE, uh, you would be subject to Sharia law. Uh, so let's say even if you had a will in um, the US, that will would not apply in the UAE because here you're treated as a Muslim and therefore the default law applies. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's kind of, um, I guess, the, the backdrop of why there's so many complexities in this particular issue so complex. And this is why it's so important for, for all who live in the UAE to consider it seriously, to, to think of it ahead of time. And um, for obvious reasons, nobody really wants to think about these topics because they're quite grim. And whether we're talking about death, and by the way, very same, very similar issues also arise in context of divorces, uh, or even marriages, um, and you know, where to register your marriage under which law. Uh, and so, as much as we don't want to talk about this or think about it, it's it's important, and because when things do happen, it can be very, very it's it's painful as it is just by virtue of that particular event happening, be death or divorce. But on top of that, the complexity, the legal complexity, the administrative complexities are very, very cha uh, challenging and painful. Um, so that's why it's important to think about them and address them ahead of time. Uh, and uh, at times like this, where we have this the global pandemic and COVID-19, it obviously that our own mortality is a lot more, we're a lot more aware of our mortality. It's a lot more on our minds on a daily basis. And so um, this is also one of the reasons why we want to discuss this topic today, because this is one where we're seeing a spike in, in people's interest because we're, we're all of a sudden starting to feel our mortality so much closer and so much more acutely than, 
than before. Uh, and so, um, so because of that, uh, this is uh, this was kind of a, a, a relevant topic to discuss in, in this particular seminar. And so, um, in terms of the legal framework, what can you do? So, if you are a Muslim, irrespective of which nationality uh, you hold the or citizenship or where you were born or you know how sort of actively um, you perhaps you pursue or you follow a particular religion if you're a muslim then you are here in the uae you're treated as a muslim and therefore with regards to be it divorces or inheritance you, uh, all of your estate will be subject to sharia so there's not very much you could do in legal terms because you cannot you cannot obviously override sharia uh, what um, can be done in those cases, for example, there are families who have, let's say, um, um, three, you know, two boys, uh, two girls, and, and a boy, and so, and it's a Muslim family, and let's say the parents want for uh, for the children to inherit equally. Uh, so, since they cannot have a will because again they're Muslim, um, so there are some other structuring of, of their assets they can do during the life of of everyone. Uh, that will ensure, for example, or at least help facilitate this this equal division of property. So what a lot of our clients do, for example, in those kind of cases, perhaps they may take whatever the commercial assets are, either put them in the trust or some sort of foundation, and then in those documents they can allocate distribution however they want, or they can just uh, reassign or re transfer those assets directly to their children the way they want um, so that the issue of inheritance does not come up. Uh, in the event of death, so that's that's far as uh, as Muslims are concerned. Now, with regards to non-Muslims, um, there are options to do a will, and now this is very important because a lot of non-Muslim expats live in the UAE and they have wills in their own home countries, and they think that's that's enough, that's helpful, that's good enough, and there's uh, no need to consider doing anything here. And many of them think that in particular because there are not, many of them don't even have uh, many assets here. So a lot of the families that, that live here, perhaps they repatriate most of their funds um, uh, back home, uh, or they have their own investments uh, in real estate at home that needs to be financed and serviced. So they don't really hold many assets here. And so they think, oh, the will is not important because you know, we don't have, most of our assets are offshore. Well, but for those families uh, who have minor children, the will, in particular, certain kinds of wills, and I'll get into that shortly, uh, are, are crucial for the purposes of guardianship. And um, so let's say if you have minor children and God forbid something were to happen to the parents, what happens to those children? Again, because for expats, this is not our country. So in most of our cases, we don't have parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles living here. Uh, to rely on for the purposes of, of uh, helping take care of, of our children that are left behind. So this is why even for those expats who perhaps don't think that they financially, they need to spend money on having a will, uh, they should think from the perspective of their children and, and the ability of someone who would ultimately, they would want to entrust their children to, to um, deal with um, either permanent guardianship or um, or at least interim guardianship and that that may involve for example taking children out of the country and taking them to whatever the home country may be uh, so so that's why wills so number one well, number one point is that it's not sufficient to have a will in your own home country because it will not in most cases it'll be very difficult if not impossible to um, uh, to enforce it here and that can kind of go into the details that we're going to compare the types of options uh, so it's much better and it's much pre much more preferable to have a locally based will. Now, with regards to the options available to do that, you have different options in, in the relevant terms. So, for example, the DIFC, that's the free zone I mentioned earlier, which is the Dubai International Financial Center, they have uh, their, own, um, uh, their own registry that they've set up a few years ago now that allows uh, non-Muslim expats to have their wills uh, and that covers... As of recently, it covers not only the, the Dubai assets, it covers all UAE assets, and on top of that, now it also covers global assets. Uh, so the DIFC is one option. And then what's important with the DIFC is it's English-based, and the, the wills are drafted in English, and everything is uh, is subject to English law, or the DIFC law that's based on English law, but at least the official language is also is 
is English. And this is important because whenever you take a, a case to a court in the UAE, if it's a local court, everything has to be done in Arabic. So if you're not Arabic, an Arabic speaker and you want to have something as a will, and the will is a very, very complex document because it touches upon everything that's dear to you, right? It touches upon the, uh, the benefits and the rights uh, of your children and uh, all of your life's uh, hard work, your assets and money, whatever else you might have amassed during your, uh, your life. Um, so, and it can be very, very complex. And so because of that, you just, it's important to remember that you want that document to be drafted in, in the language that you, you can understand. Most people in the UAE at least speak English to some extent. So, whereas you know, fewer people speak Arabic. So drafting and understanding that, Arabic, that, that particular document in Arabic is, um, you know, is a factor that needs to be considered. Uh, so there's a DFC will, and the DFC in particular, in addition to all the other benefits, it allows specifically allows to provide for uh, have a provision for guardianship and custody for the children, and so that is where uh, I would highly encourage that all those expats that have minor children who are non-Muslim, that they in the very least consider because there are options and more simplified wills where that provide only for custody and guardianship, and I, I would highly encourage that that be the case that people look into it and at least provide some sort of roadmap for their children in the event of a tragedy that happens. Uh, so the DFC is one, and then we go a little more granular in terms of the differences. Um, the other option, the DFC obviously is in Dubai, so it's the Dubai International Financial Center. And then the other option is, um, uh, is the Dubai Courts. So you can also register a will in, the, in Dubai Courts. And uh, now in Dubai Courts, it will be, uh, it has to be drafted in Arabic. And Arabic will always prevail. Uh, you can also you could do it in dual languages, but Arabic will be the leading language. Uh, and then there is also Abu Dhabi, and Abu Dhabi courts uh, also now offers for expats, non Muslim expats, to register their wills once again. In Abu Dhabi, it's also it has to be the, the primary language is Arabic, and every will has to be drafted in Arabic. Now, with regards to the options, so now you have the DFC wills, you have the Dubai courts wills, and you have the Abu Dhabi wills. Um, and why we use these three particular examples is because uh, in Abu Dhabi in particular uh, now offers clearly global wills because that was not always the option, but it, all, it allows people to put in their, all of their estate globally into this will and register with Abu Dhabi courts. Now, but it also provides for the ability to account for the rights of, and, and, uh, of guardianship and custody. Uh, so, so now Abu Dhabi courts, in the will, you can include and your global estate and provisions for your children in terms of custody and guardianship. With Dubai courts, there seem to be similar um, similar um, options available, uh, but there seems to be more of a template will that's a little more restrictive in terms of what you can include, um, though that is also a bit of a moving target and it's changing from the more flexible. Uh, so, and this is why we use these three, because other Emirates may have similar options, for example, Ajman and um, Amal Kuwain, but um, it, there have not been specific regulations allowing for wills to be registered with the courts that would allow people to include, for example, real estate, which is very important, um, and then also global assets and custody and guardianship. So whereas Dubai courts and Abu Dhabi courts have come out and said that clearly that they do include. So now we have the three options, CIC, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. Uh, with regards to the cost, however, it, it, the difference is quite significant. Uh, Abu Dhabi courts are least, or I guess most affordable, or at least expensive. Uh, so the courts, um, if you want to do just a single will, it's about a thousand dirhams, and even that is kind of since we're going down. And then if you do double mirror, uh, double wills are called mirror wills, it's about 1,900 dirhams just to register the will. That's just the fee you pay to the court. Obviously, then, if you want a lawyer to draft this for you and then legal translations and such, you need to kind of add that to the cost. And then with Dubai courts, it's about, for single will, it's about 3,000 dirhams or 2,900 dirhams. And for a double will or, or uh, mirror wills, it's 5,800 um, 5, dirhams. Uh, so now the DIFC, on the other hand, it's for single will, it's 10,500 dirhams. So we've got DFC 10,500 dirhams, and Dubai Court's about 3,000 dirhams, and then Abu Dhabi Court's about 1,000 dirhams. So the difference is quite significant. And for double wills or mirror wills in the DFC, it's about 16,000 dirhams. 
So the costs are significant, uh, but the benefits are um, uh, so in, in a way um, representative of, I guess, or perhaps um, could justify uh, the additional costs. There's a lot more we could say, but we're running uh, very, very short on time uh, on this special webinar edition of the Yamala and Plethor podcast. Logical with Council Bar. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, and Ludmilla Yamalava is the managing partner of Yamalava and Plethka, based here in JLT, Jumeirah Lakes Towers in Dubai. My name's Tim Elliott. Each week we produce Logical. It's in an effort to cover all manner of issues pertinent legally here in the United Arab Emirates, and I guess, to some extent, beyond uh, certain points as well. You can find Logical with Ludmilla and I wherever you usually find your podcasts. Once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you.